Yeah, yeah. I'll just keep writing. <laughs> I think so. Uh, yeah. So good morning, everybody, and uh, hopefully the weather will be less exciting today than it was yesterday. But in the meantime, we could have our third lecture from Ken about supersymmetry. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so I just wanted to continue where I left off. Um, so I'll, I'll be talking a little bit about theories with four supercharges. And so the four supercharges could be 4D n equals 1, where it's these q alpha and q bar alpha dot. Or we could also reduce it down to 3D. And in 3D, it's called n equals 2 because there's a more minimal version with two supercharges. And in 2D, it's called n equals 2 comma 2. So I'll say some things about the, all of these different cases in parallel. But So we have the chiral superfields, which um, I'll write as x. Before I was writing this as like x with a little bar, on it, bar in it, and then it got very ugly. So I'm just going to call it phi now. And then there's the fermion. This, this is called an auxiliary field. And this field won't be dynamical. So when we look at, its, um, at the Lagrangian, we'll see that there are no terms involving this f. And so we can just eliminate it. And this often happens in, this, this always happens in supersymmetry because it kind of accounts for the difference between the number of degrees of freedom on shell versus off shell. So with supersymmetry, we want a pairing between bosons and fermions. And so there's a nice pairing. Um, on shell, like for instance, um, this psi is, is a two-component fermion. So here I've suppressed the fact that there's, there's an alpha index and an alpha index here. So this is two um, fermions on shell. And then this is um, two, a complex scalar. So that has also two degrees of freedom. So it's a matching of degrees of freedom uh, on shell between the bosons and the fermions. But once we go off shell, then you know, things can pick up extra components. Like here, the fact that this satisfies like a Dirac equation eliminates some of the components. And so that's, that's what this thing is making up for. So it's something that goes away at, at the end. So I mentioned that we can write down a Lagrangian where one thing we can do is we can integrate over all of super, or Lagrangian density, we can integrate over all of super space with a, a function that's called the Kähler potential as a function of these chiral superfields and antichiral superfields. And then we can also introduce a superpotential where we integrate only over half of superspace. And then we have a holomorphic function of the xi's. So this thing has to be independent of xi bar. And, and, and that's crucial for making this preserve supersymmetry. So it's, it's thanks to the fact that these xi's satisfy um, so in, in superspace, we'll write this d bar alpha dot of x i is 0. And thanks to this constraint, this thing is still supersymmetric, even though we're only integrating over half of superspace. And what happens in, in supersymmetry is that this thing ends up being highly constrained by the fact that it's independent of x bar. So the, this holomorphy constraint gives um, a lot of power for the superpotential. So often we can say exact statements about the superpotential. Like in an effective field theory, if we have some low energy effective field theory, here I imagine that you know, someone just hands you this theory. But we could also say that this might be the low energy effective field theory for some UV theory that you know, we're trying to guess what the output is from the machine. And so then we'd like to figure out what, what is the superpotential. And sometimes using the fact that it's holomorphic, we can exactly determine the superpotential. But on the other hand, this thing is less constrained. So often we can't determine the Kähler potential. Um, and yeah, just, just to say again, these lower indices denote derivatives. So like gij bar is 
Um, maybe I could have just gij bar is kij bar, which is And we could we could write down various different examples. I mentioned the canonical Kähler potential is phi i bar. So this this will lead to this thing being one, and then it's just canonical Kähler potentials, or car, sorry, canonical kinetic terms. And, and this dot dot dot, by the way, includes the fermion terms. Um, another thing we could write down as an example is the Kähler potential for CP1. Like suppose that we want to write down a CP1 sigma model. Then we can say that this is, um, actually let me, let me write it in terms of, in terms of the x's. Okay, this gives what's called the Fubini Studi metric for CP1. So we can write down various diff you know, different examples. Okay. So actually, last time after the. Yes? So, um, the problem is finite, I think. But the last time that you had an example, um, you've got GIJ bar, and then you had a model that you wanted to write down. And you said that. Oh, good. Okay, yeah. So, so the question was, which part of the Lagrangian does um, does this last term come from? Yeah, that's a that's a good point. So so basically, where it comes from is um, so so there's going to be a term which is like d four theta, and now now what I can do is I can um, expand out this Kähler potential as a function of these chiral superfields. And so one of the terms that we'll have is um, this k i j bar, and then um, times theta squared f i theta bar squared f bar i bar. Okay. So, th so there's going to be a term like that involving these auxiliary fields f. And then, um, and then there's going to be plus a term which is integral d two theta, and then there will be w i times theta squared f i plus Hermitian conjugate plus dot dot dot. And so, so basically, what happens is now um, this d two theta kind of cancels off with this. We use the inter integral d theta of theta. So the integral d2, d, d4 theta of theta squared, theta bar squared is one. And anything else would get zero with this. So for this integral d4 theta, we we're only looking for the theta squared, theta bar squared term. And for the integral d2 theta, we're only looking for the theta squared term. That gives one, and everything else goes away. So. So this thing is going to kind of cancel off with that thing. And so we'll end up with some terms where it's kij bar times this fi, f bar, i bar. So basically now we could just solve for this field by its equations of motion because it, it has no kinetic term. And so we can just kind of integrate it out. And when, you, when we eliminate f and f, then we'll end up getting that term at the end. And, and the gij bar with the upper indices means the inverse. So it's, it's basically like, um, when we solve for this, we have to invert this this thing. Yeah, thanks. On the second line, that's an integral sign, not a Lagrangian, right? Yes. That is an integral sign. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, any, any other things? Okay, so um, so this this gives a potential which Which, which satisfies our um, condition of, so schematically it gives some kind of, you know, potential which satisfies 
our condition of being positive definite. So we saw that um, that the Hamiltonian we could write as as sum of well, let's we had this h omega omega. Okay, so we should have some potential which which is positive definite, and then there could be the supersymmetric vacuum or the places where the potential vanishes. And so So the Susie vacua are at the places where Wi equals zero, assuming um, Gij bar is not zero. So, so usually this Gij bar wouldn't be zero unless we, we pick some, um, you know, we, we, we want this thing to be a nice metric, but if we do some crazy field redefinition, we end up with um, something where we might introduce some, some subtleties. So as long as this thing is some nice, as long as Gij bar is some nice metric and we can take its inverse, then the Suzy vacuum at the places where, where this is zero, maybe, maybe I'll just write it more explicitly, dw d phi i is zero for all i. So we solve these equations, and then that's where the Suzy vacua are. Okay. okay, so we could look at, at a set of examples. Uh, just to give some simple examples, we could take um, the superpotential to be um, some coupling constant times, that's right, it's like x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1. W prime is is g x to the n, and so this this is a um, th this is a superpotential which has a supersymmetric vacuum at x equals to zero, and the supersymmetric vacuum at x equals to zero, actually, we should think about it in a way as as n vacua that are on top of each other because if we deform this thing, if we thought about this as like some kind of Landau Ginzburg. Um, Giving some Lando against root theory. Actually, maybe I should just say. So we'll from this we'll get a potential v. Maybe I shouldn't have used the same letter g. Let's call this lambda. So if we if we were to deform this by some lower order terms, and actually what what are the lower order terms that that are kind of independent, we could we can deform by um, well we we could add one, but that's that's actually if we add one that's not really going to do anything because everything just involves derivatives of this w, but we. Let's just list it anyway. We could deform by x, x squared, all the way up to x to the n minus 1. And and x to the n is, is redundant. And what I mean here by redundant is we could well, one way to say it is we could eliminate it in favor of the other ones just by shifting x. So if we just shift x, we could eliminate it in terms of the others. Another thing about it is that um, we can write the equations of motion um, so we can actually write the equations of motion in superspace by taking a, a variation with respect to x. And if, if we do that, what we'll get is d bar squared of um, ki plus um, okay yep maybe 
maybe I'll just maybe I'll just say it in words. So so this is by taking d by d variant with respect to x i. And okay, so so this tells us that the, this derivative of of um, w. I'll just write this. This is w x. So here um, the derivative of w is is what I'm talking about here, we could write it as d bar squared of the Kähler potential. So it's not an independent operator. It's d bar squared of the Kähler potential. So, so I'll just, um, so this is d bar squared of the Kähler potential. So we won't list that. And if we, did the, if we did a generic deformation like this, what we would find is that here we would have an order n polynomial, and so we would know that there are n different roots. This is like some complex polynomial, and we just solve for it. And so we'll see that um, the deform theory has n Suzy vacua. solve this order n polynomial for w prime being zero. And all of these different Suzy vacua, if you look at it carefully, you'll find that all of these Suzy vacua, we can assign a minus one to the f. And all of these Suzy vacua have the same value of minus one to the f. So we can assign them all minus one to the f equals plus one for all. So the, the Witten index of this theory is just uh, n. Okay, so this so this is a theory with with Witten index, and so let's let's just do a check. So if we if we took for instance n to be one, then n equals one would be a mass term. So if we look at this potential, um, if we took n to be one, let me write this as like. Okay, so if we took n to be one, this would be a mass term, um, and then there would just be one supersymmetric vacuum at the origin. And then for higher n, what happens is that's that's what it's like at each one of the local minima. So we have some kind of graph like this where w prime squared is the potential. Uh, it has n supersymmetric vacua. Okay, so so this theory gives an analog of what I was discussing yesterday when I talked about these landau ginzburg models that can flow to the minimal models. Um, so I'll, I'll discuss this this theory now in four dimensions, and three dimensions, and in two dimensions. But like in in two. In, in four dimensions, just to say quickly, in four dimensions, um, we won't get to anything too interesting from these theories. In three dimensions, there's a case that's like a supersymmetric analog of the Wilson Fisher fixed point. And in two dimensions, there's uh, super minimal models. Okay. Um, How do you say the width index is one? Is there a why you can assign it the same to be the same for all the, the different vacua. Um, yeah, basically, basically it's just because we can assign, um, yeah, so, so one, one argument, I guess, would be that um, we could think of this minus one to the f as, as a subgroup of, of the, R symmetry. So I'll discuss now the R symmetry. And so we can assign a, an R symmetry to the field X. So that, that's what I'll talk about now. And then we can think about minus one to the F is in terms of that R symmetry. And so, so by using that, we can kind of see that in each one of these different vacuo, we can kind of really expand potential and, and say that, that the field is basically just like an X squared uh, super potential locally at these points. And, we can read it off from the from the R charge of X. Yeah, thanks. Okay, yeah. So so what's the R U N R symmetry? Um, 
So the R charge So we can ask if the theory has a UNR symmetry, and we can write down theories that do have an R symmetry or theories that don't have an R symmetry. So what, what should an R symmetry do? What, what we want is the R charge for, um, for the Q alpha we took to be minus 1 is plus 1. Um, and correspondingly, we assign R charges some R charges to the, these coordinates theta on superspace. So if, if we were to say that our chiral superfield Xi has some R charge, let's call it Ri, so then when we do this expansion, um, So, so if we assign R charge Ri to, to this field, this is a complex field. So what I mean by assigning R charge is we do a, a U1 phase rotation, and then this thing will, will pick up some phase with, with this Ri in the exponent. OK, so, so this thing we should also assign charge Ri. Um, the theta carry, under this assignment carries R charge plus 1. It's kind of conjugate to this Q. And so, so this thing has r equals 1. And so this thing has, should have charge ri minus 1. And this thing has charge ri minus 2. And this. OK, so we want our, if it's an R symmetry, we want our Lagrangian to be neutral. And so we should assign charge 0 to the Lagrangian density. This thing has, has R charge 2, has R charge 0. It's 2 minus 2. This thing, so we assign R charge 1 to um, theta. So this d2 theta counts as having R charge minus 2 because we want to do do something consistent with this. And so this thing has charge 2, this thing has charge minus 2, and that's how it can end up giving something that's just a number. Um, so then the superpotential should have R charge 2. So we want to assign, and the Kähler potential should have R charge 0. OK, so I'll just write it again. So the charge. If, if it's a symmetry, we want that to be 0. And the R charge of the superpotential, we want that to be 2. OK, so, so if I took, for instance, a superpotential, which was this lambda over n plus 1, This thing has a U1R symmetry with, I'll, I'll assume that the Kähler potential is, say, a canonical Kähler potential. So the canonical Kähler potential, um, yeah, so maybe let's, let's take K to be, for instance, x bar x. So this thing is automatically going to, going to have be fine with the R symmetry, because x will pick up some phase, and x bar is like the complex conjugate will pick up the opposite phase. So this will respect the R symmetry. And the superpotential has a U1 R symmetry if um, the R charge of x is 2 over n plus 1, so that if I take it to the n plus 1 power, I get R charge 2, which is the R charge for the superpotential. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So, so the the comment was, if I deform the theory, then um, 
then I'll break the R symmetry, which, which is absolutely true. So like for example, so suppose I took the super potential to be um, lambda over three x cubed, and now I'll, I'll deform it by a mass term x squared. So, so here I would say that if I just had this thing to begin with, I could make, have an R symmetry where x has R charge 2 thirds, but then this thing would violate that R symmetry. And so, so here, this thing does not have an R. If lambda and m are both non-zero. Uh, oh, uh -huh. Don't people say m is some school Ah uh, yes, yes. In fact, yeah. I was just trying to decide if if I should mention that um, now or not. Yeah, maybe, maybe since you mentioned it, I'll mention it. So, so the comment was about um, about assigning charges to M, and yeah. So maybe I'll just quickly mention mention that. that there's a um, basically if you have a, a case like this where it looks like the symmetry is broken, there's a way to still get mileage out of the symmetry, even though it looks like the symmetry is broken. By, by treating these coupling constants as what are called spurions. So a spurion means that you, you, treat, you think of the coupling constant as like the expectation value of some background field or of some, some field. And so what we could do is we could say that um, we have a symmetry which is, let's call it U1X, another symmetry which is called U1R. We could make a table of charges. And so we could say that we started off with our field X. Here U and X is like another um, global symmetry that's a non-R symmetry that just rotates X. So, so let's assign X to have um, charge one under U and X. And let's assign X to have charge two thirds under U and R. So now, um, now we can say that if we want this to be a symmetry, the superpotential, so if this is a non-R symmetry, the superpotential should just be neutral. And so I'm just going to demand that it be neutral if, it, if it's a, um, so this is um, non-R symmetry. Non-R means it commutes with the supercharges and we should assign charge zero to the thetas. And so the superpotential would have to be invariant. And um, the superpotential should have R charge two. And now what we can do is we could include lambda and M as if there are some additional fields. So we'll say that there's a lambda and there's a M. And so lambda, in order to have this be a symmetry, I would assign a charge minus three so that this thing is neutral under that. And um, under U1R, it has charge zero because it's preserving that R symmetry. And then under, and then for M, we would assign charge minus two. And this has charge, um, we want this to be two thirds. So if M has charge two thirds and X has charge two thirds, the whole thing will end up having charge two. So, so now we can say that, okay, the reason why M is violating that R symmetry is because it has charge under that R symmetry. And so if it's non-zero, then it explicitly violates the R symmetry. And the idea of, of a spurion is that we could still get some mileage if we think about this, if we think about explicit breaking, yeah, so maybe I'll say here the comment is that we can say that M explicitly Um, U1R, and also both couplings explicitly violate this UNX. Um, but let's just focus on U1R. So we'll say M explicitly breaks U1R, but if we think of M as being like the expectation value of some chiral superfield, which we'll also, let's just also call it M, then what we could do is we'll say, okay, that chiral superfield should just have this charge two thirds, 
And then when it gets a non-zero expectation value, that spontaneously breaks the symmetry. And so instead of thinking about explicit breaking, we can think about it as spontaneous breaking. And then once it's spontaneous breaking, we can kind of convince ourselves that, OK, this is just some property of the vacuum, but the theory should still somehow respect the symmetry. And what, what that means is we can still get selection rules. And so we can still impose um, some conditions where we'll, we'll just keep track of these charge assignments, and then we can still make some exact statements. In fact, this, this theory, um, we can argue that there's um, this W is not renormalized. Uh, so the, the only renormalization of this theory in this case is just um, some Z factors that we could put into the Kähler potential. But the, the, so because of those, those Z factors, this, these couplings do run. But aside from the running that we can account for by the wave function renormalization Z factors, this superpotential is not renormalized. And we can argue for that just by saying, OK, whatever the superpotential is in the effective theory, it should respect all of these symmetries. And then basically, this is the unique thing that you can write down that matches all the different limits. And so, so this is something that, um, that, that Cyberg used a lot in the 90s. In fact, he has a, his, his talk here was called The Power of um, Symmetry. And so he had earlier papers, The Power of Duality, and then an earlier paper, which was The Power of Holomorphy. And so this was like the power of holomorphy, that the, using the fact that the superpotential is holomorphic, you can get some mileage. Because it, what happens is that we think about it as hol holomorphic, not just in, we think about it as holomorphic, not just in x, but also in these spurions, lambda and m. And so what that means is that there's no lambda bar and there's no m bar in the superpotential. And so the fact that there's no lambda bar and m bar, because the, these things could have been expectation values of chiral superfields, is highly constraining. And so, yeah, so I was trying to decide if I wanted to talk about this whole spring thing you're asking. Okay, any other? Okay, so, so we can now, what happens to, um, to this theory with the R symmetry um, or, or any of its deformations under RG flow. And so maybe I'll just say we could, we could study this theory in um, D equals four, for example. And what happens is that, let, let's look at, um, at, at W equals X cubed. So W equals X cubed leads to, um, so there's a term in the Lagrangian, which is the second derivative. Um, I don't really care about the normalization, but let's, let's just divide it by three. So there, there will be a term which is like a second derivative of W times psi psi. So this is like a Yukawa coupling. Uh, let's put in here lambda. So we have a Lagrangian that looks like this. So there's a, a Yukawa coupling, and then there's a phi to the fourth term. And so we know we know the answer in 4D theories, which is that this is this interaction is marginally irrelevant. So if you look at it class, using classical dimensional analysis, you would say it's marginal because we would assign dimension one to phi and three halves to psi. And then we would say that this is a dimension four, which means it's a marginal deformation. But then we know that once, once lambda is non-zero, then we have to get, we will get some quantum corrections from the beta functions. And so what happens is that this lambda has a beta function, which is positive, and so it's marginally irrelevant. 
The marginally part isn't really that interesting. It just means that it, the beta function goes to zero, it's lambda goes to zero, but it's, it's basically irrelevant. And um, we, we, can also, we can also see that this is irrelevant actually using the superconformal algebra. So uh, I wanted to say some things about the superconformal algebra in general, but maybe, maybe I'll just say that there's a, in a superconformal field theory, For all of these theories, it has a U1R, which is, um, it has a U1R whose current is related by supersymmetry to the stress tensor. It's in the same supermultiplet as the stress tensor. I, I think if I have time, maybe in the, in the next lecture, I'll say some things about the superconformal algebra in different dimensions. But for the moment, I, I just wanted to make a, some quick comments about um, about RG flows for these classes of theories. So maybe just believe me that there's, uh, that, that the algebra relates the stress tensor to an R symmetry. So if it's a superconformal theory, there has to be a conserved R symmetry. So, so like, like for instance, this theory that doesn't have this, the, the R symmetry can't be a superconformal field theory, but it could be a theory along the RG flow. So actually, if, if I were to look at this, at this superpotential, what I would see is that as I go along the RG flow, this one is more relevant. So this is a more relevant operator. So this thing is going to win in the infrared. So we'll have an RG flow where in the, in the deep infrared, we can just cross out this term. The X squared term will win. And we'll go to the, super potent, the theory with the superpotential of X squared. That's a mass term, which, which tells us that the theory is just a gapped trivial theory in the infrared. So this, this theory would flow to just a massive gapped trivial theory in the infrared. But on the other hand, if we set the M term to zero, um, then it's this, this case. And in this case, instead of going to the massive theory in the infrared, what it just goes to is a free field in the infrared. So lambda goes to zero, and it just goes to a free field in the infrared. And, and one way to see that it's a free field is by using this fact that the superconformal algebra has the, the R symmetry. And what happens with the R symmetry that's nice is that um, yes. Yeah, yeah, so, um, yeah, so, okay, so let me, yeah, so, so, so the question was, how could this be a free field if the R charge of X is fractional? So, yeah, I was just kind of thinking about how to, how I want to present this. Um, so, okay, so, so in the superconformal theory, um, the fields which are, there, there's some fields which are called Chiral primary operators, and these these chiral primary operators are in short multiplets. of the superconformal algebra. So I haven't said yet what specifically what the superconformal algebra is, but these are in some short multiplets. Short multiplets means that, that they have some null states. And so the null states are just this Q bar alpha dot, for instance, acting on a, a chiral primary operator is zero. And so the fact that they are in these short multiplets means that they satisfy some conditions related to the fact that this null state has vanishing norm. And basically what so, yeah, basically, let's, let's write it this way. So we have some inner product 
where for unitary theory, we're going to demand that this thing is bigger than or equal to zero. And then this thing ends up being like a descendant. And so we'll also say that, oh, um, Q, let's, let's just write it as absolute value squared of this Q bar alpha dot. will also demand to be bigger than or equal to zero in general. And so these, these chiral primary operators saturate this inequality where this descendant is, is zero. Now in the, in the superconformal algebra, what happens is that, um, yeah, ba ba basically we can rewrite this now as O um, Q bar alpha dot dagger Um, is, let, let's try to solve for when, actually, let's, let's write the inequality. So this is bigger than or equal to zero. And now what happens is that if, if this thing is a primary operator, the condition that it's a primary operator is that these daggered operators annihilate it. And so, like, we'll have some, some kind of multiplet where the primary operator is at the bottom. And then we can get the sentence. So in the, in the non susy case, we get the sentence by acting with P mu. In the Susie case, we can get the sentence by acting with Q alpha or Q bar alpha dot. So those give us descendants. And then there's some daggered operators, which, which are like lowering operators. The daggered operators are actually extra supercharges that we get thanks to it being super conformal. So if this theory has four supercharges without being super conformal, it gets some actually doubled the supercharges once it's super conformal. And, and that's because in the conformal field theory, there was this P mu and then there was this K mu that I mentioned. And basically these extra, extra ones, um, we could give them names, but for the moment, let me just call them the daggered ones. These anti-commute to give the K mu that are these lowering operators. So, so basically what happens is that this operator is going to annihilate that operator. So we could, for free, replace this with a commutator. And now, now we can use the superconformal algebra to, to say something about that commutator. And yes? Yeah, we don't we don't give it a new name. So we, we, we wouldn't say that, that this is we would still say this is like an n equals one superconformal field theory, even though at if it's conformal it actually has eight supercharges, but we would still call it n equals one. Yeah. Yeah, so so basically what we get now is um, From that null state condition, we get some inequality. Um, so Q bar alpha dot. Implies that, so when, once we use that commutator, we'll end up, uh, I could leave this as an exercise maybe. To, so we'll use the commutator, and then we'll look up what the commutator is in terms of the algebra. And we'll see that the dimension of the operator is bigger than or equal to some number times the R charge of the operator. There could be extra terms uh, if there's spin. But here, if, if O is scalar, these extra terms are, are gone. So we just get. The dimension of the operator is bigger than or equal to some number times the R charge of the operator. And the number depends on what space time dimension we're in. And the way that I the way that I always remember the number or, or work it out 
is say that let's let's look again at the at the term with the d2 theta of the superpotential. So if we want this to to be scale invariant, we want to assign this thing dimension, the operator dimension, which is the space-time dimension. And now this d2 theta ends up having dimension, uh, effectively it has dimension one. So like, like if we had d dx, we would assign that dimension minus d, but so because of the rules of Grassmann integration, this thing ends up having dimension one. And so this thing should have dimension d minus one, the, the operator dimension. So the operator dimension of a, of a superpotential is d minus one. The R charge of a superpotential, we said, is two. And so that, that's how I remember what this number is. So, so if it were the superpotential, I should get d minus one and two. So, so this thing is d minus over two in d space-time dimensions. So for instance, in 4D, um, the dimension of, of a scalar chiral operator is or, or the dimension of a, of a operator is in general bigger than or equal to three halves times the R charge of the operator. And this is saturated. It's saturated if this thing is, is actually zero, and that's chiral primary. This is, again, for scalar operators. There's, there's an analog of this for operators with spin. And OK, so, so what do we get for this case of R? So, so for the case where the superpotential is x cubed, then we would say that the R charge of x equals 2 thirds. And so that tells us that the dimension of x is 1. And the dimension of the scalar x is a free field. So, so we can see just from, um, just from the superconformal algebra that this x cubed theory has to be irrelevant. It can't possibly give us an interacting theory. Because if, if it gave us an interacting superconformal field theory, it would have to have an R charge. But the only R charge is this 2 thirds one, which forces it to be a free field. So, so actually, we can use that. We, we knew it was going to be a free field anyway. Um, so if we put in here a coupling lambda, beta of lambda, we knew anyway a weak coupling that it's infrared free. But we could ask, maybe, maybe there's asymptotic safety where the beta function goes to 0 here. And then this, this could be like a UV fixed point. But this, this is basically ruled out, like this UV fixed point. that have these UV fixed points with asymptotic safety. But uh, we can basically rule that out even though it, so the, um, so this argument is completely non-perturbative. It doesn't get as big. So even though you know, someone might complain, well, what if lambda is so huge that perturbation theory is completely breaking down? How do we know? Well, just by using the superconformal algebra, we know that there can't be an interacting fixed point. So. Yeah, so, so actually, R charge 2 thirds is exactly the value in four dimensions for a free field. Okay. Is there any question about that? Yes. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. So, so the um, so the question was how do how do we know that um, that that R charge that we could see, you know, just from looking at it is is actually the R charge of a possible infrared fixed point, like. Like here, for instance, we might wonder, maybe there's some emergent R symmetry, which assigns a different R charge. Yeah, that's fair enough. I can't, I can't really rule out some completely emergent symmetry that maybe just gives a different R charge. So, so this argument is, is maybe slightly making some assumptions that there's no extra emergent R symmetry that, that could have led to a fixed point. Yeah, I don't, I don't have a quick argument against that. That's a good comment. Okay, so what, what about this theory in three dimensions? So in, in 3D, so, so this is like the Susie Wilson Fisher. And so, so again, I'm, I'm going to assume that there's no emergent R symmetry. So the R symmetry of the superconformal field theory is the one that we can read off from here. So, so we'll say that the R charge of X, again, is 2 thirds. And so then the, the dimension of X in this case, so, um, so, this, so D is 3. And so the dimension is just the R charge. And um, the dimension for a free field, for a free scalar, in general, is d minus 2 over 2, which is 1 half. So, so this thing is, is bigger than 1 half. There's always a unitarity bound that says that the dimension has to be bigger than or equal to the free field dimension. And if it's equal to the free field dimension, it's, it's a free field. Two thirds is bigger than a half is, is a good check. Otherwise, it would have violated unitarity. Um, quite a short. Okay, so there's. There's some level two descendant, which the fact that this thing should have positive norm tells us that the dimension should be bigger than the free field dimension. And okay, so, so this is the exact operator. Um, this would be the exact operator dimension for that operator. So like in the, in the Wilson Fisher fixed point. By, by the way, um, I had a few, a few questions about, um, I had a few questions about this yesterday, so maybe I'll just make a comment. So without supersymmetry, so we, we could turn on this. Suppose we had a real scalar field with a phi to the fourth potential. Then, then the claim is, is that this flows to this Wilson Fisher. And the, the relevant operator, so, so we start off with a, a free scalar field. With this uh, phi the fourth term, we flow to this interacting conformal field theory. And now we can ask, what are the relevant deformations of that conformal field theory? And we can read it off from, from this. OK, let's just write it like this. So the, um, the potential is phi the fourth. Um, we could read it off from the potential because we'll say that, that the relevant operators correspond to one, the, the deformations of this thing. So there's one phi, phi, phi squared. And then phi cubed is a redundant operator because we can eliminate it by the equations of motion. And so this phi is the thing that, like in, in two dimensions, we know is we, we often call the, the sigma operator, the spin operator. 
And this phi squared is the thing that we call the epsilon operator. And so like, it, like if we think about this as an icing model, then turning on this deformation is like turning on a magnetic field. And turning on this one is like changing the temperature. And so, so they're relevant operators. And like in the, in the two-dimensional case, we know the dimension of these operators because you know, they're minimal model operators and we know the exact operator dimensions. So we know that these have like h equals h bar and with 1 16th and 1 half. And it's hard to connect that to the phi and the phi squared from the original description. Or like in, in three dimensions, these operator dimensions are studied from the bootstrap approach or from other approaches. But here, just by using uh, supersymmetry, we can say that the exact operator dimension of, of this operator x is this 2 thirds. And so, um, so if we wanted to deform this by a relevant operator, which is like x, we would know exactly what that operator dimension is. Question on that? Maybe I should look at my notes to see. Uh -huh. uh, is the, the CZ Wilson Fisher derivative here? Is this uh, what, what m? What curly m is this? One. Uh, you, you mean? Uh, Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, in fact, th this, this is a fun example, this x cubed theory, because so this, this x cubed theory, um, so, so maybe I should just, yeah, so the question is what, what is this in terms of the, the minimal models or, um, so actually in, yeah, let me. Ah, okay, okay, thank you, Oliver. This is n equals 2 in 3D. Yeah, sorry, I misunderstood the question. Thanks, Oliver. This is what we would call n equals 2 in 3D. Yeah. Yeah, if, and now, now in two dimensions, in two dimensions, we can do exactly the same thing. And so, so in, in two dimensions, all of all of these things. Okay, so let's go to, to d equals two. So in d equals 2, this is relevant for all n. So for all n, it, it takes us to a new fixed point. And so we'll say that we'll have an RG flow where the, the central charge in two dimensions would be um, the U, and the UV limit would be just for a free chiral superfield. So I'll imagine that I start with just a free chiral superfield and then I perturb by this. So the central charge for a free chiral superfield, it's a, a complex scalar. So the, each component of the scalar has central charge one, and it's a complex one, so I'll say it's one plus one. And then it has these fermionic components, and the fermionic components has C equals a half. And so it's a half plus a half because it's a, a two-component fermion. And so the, the central charge in the UV is three. And now... Um, this theory flows to some central charge in the infrared. So we deform it by lambda not equals to zero, and we get to some central charge in the infrared. And um, the, the central charge in the infrared is associated with some supersymmetric versions of the minimal models. And there are various ways that, that I could write down the central charge in the infrared. One, one idea that I had, depending on the time, is to show how to write down the central charge in the infrared from a, a Tuft matching condition. So, um, you have 15 minutes. Okay. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, so maybe. Yeah, so let's let, let's write down um, what are what's the chiral ring. Um, so the, the chiral ring are just all the chiral primary operators. And so the chiral primary operators are 1x, x squared, up to x to the n minus 1. And then, so these are chiral primary. And then we remember that x to the n is proportional to d bar squared of the Kähler potential, so it's not, not a chiral primary. So we'll, we'll stop at x to the n. Uh-huh. If, if that uh, interaction is relevant for in any case, then why would CIR change? So for a primary C, can CIR not Oh, yeah, so, so CIR is something that I'm going to write down in a second. It's, it's going to be. We'll, so we'll get by the C theorem some C infrared, which is less than C UV. And um, I, I haven't written it down yet. But yeah, so the fact that it's relevant means that um, so we have this picture where the, the free, so this, this, this is a, a free chiral superfield. And so there's some kind of RG flow, which is like flowing down a mountain, where this free theory is, is at the top of the mountain. And then when we turn this lambda on, it, it starts to flow down. And it's flowing down, it means that there's some C function which is decreasing. And then eventually it, it stops. And so, so this lambda is going to go from like lambda UV goes to zero, lambda in the infrared goes to some fixed point. And then once it's at that fixed point, there will be some new central charge, which is by the C theorem has to be less than CUV. Okay, so, so there, there are a bunch of results that we could use about um, 2D. This is, by the way, 2D uh, curly N equals 2-2, two, two, uh, super conformal field theory in the infrared. And for super conformal field theories, we can assign, we can write delta is h plus h bar. Um, and then the spin would be like h minus h bar. And um, also, we could assign left and right R charges. Maybe I should call them R plus R bar. Let's call them little r. Okay, so we can assign left and right R charges. Uh, we see from, from this formula that if it's a superconformal field theory for the chiral operators, um, is so if D is 2, um, that becomes 1 half. Yes. Can I ask a question that I know yes. the answer to, but people may be wondering? Oh, good, good, thanks. Why, why do you call it 2 comma 2 and not just n equals 4? Oh, good, good, OK. Um, yeah, so, so the question is, why do I call it 2 comma 2? So, so basically, when I, um, when I <clears throat> reduce to, to two dimensions, we can have both uh, like left-moving fermions and right-moving fermions, and so um, Two, 2 comma 2 means that for both the left movers and the right movers, there's this n equals 2 supersymmetry. And <clears throat> this is what we would get if we just do, if we just compactified, like for instance, this 3D n equals 2 theory on a circle. Whenever you compactify in a circle, you, you end up with um, the fermions in the higher dimensional theory decompose into fermions in the lower dimensional theory. and but we won't get chiral fermions in the lower dimensional theory that way. We'll, we'll get something that's non-chiral. So non-chiral in the sense that it has the same um, kind of same fermions for both the left movers and the right movers. So in terms of 2D chirality, 
if, you, if we just do this dimensional reduction on a circle, we'll get something where it's the same number of supercharges for left movers and right movers. But we could consider other theories that, that have different numbers of supercharges for left movers and right movers. And these are the kinds of theories that you consider, for instance, like in heterotic string theories. You have some different number of supercharges for left movers and right movers. Um, yeah, so, so, so in this case, there's, there's kind of a symmetry between left movers and right movers, but you could consider theories without, without that. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So in, in six dimensions, what happens is that, um, yes, maybe, yeah. So the question, the question was about, um, about, uh, 60 theories. Yeah, so, so basically we should just look at um, spinner representations in different dimensions. And so, so like in, in 60, um, for instance, we can have, um, so the, the Lorentz group, if we were to go to Euclidean space, just to make it um, kind of more familiar. So we will say that we'll have some Lorentz group, which is like SO6, which is basically like SU4. And we could have spinners which are like in the four or the four bar of SU4. And So minimal so th this is kind of a aside that I'll, I'll come back to, to the two dimensions, but just as a aside about the chirality. Minimal CZ in 60 has what we would say n equals 1 comma 0 supersymmetry with two supercharges in one of these ones, let's say the four. And basically the, the supercharges should anti-commute to give momentum. And so, so the group theory is that if you if we think about the, the group theory of SU4, then if we look at 4 times 4, we could either look at something that's anti-symmetric or symmetric. And this, this one that's anti-symmetric, so this is 4, 4, this is 6, and this is 10. So this is the vector. So we can, we can get a vector by anti-symmetrizing two things in the four. And so what, what we can do is we can have, um, with the two supercharges in the four, we can do this anti-symmetrization and get the vector. And so that's, um, that's minimal supersymmetry. It's what we would say has one zero because the supercharges are only in the four and they're none in the four bar. And then we could look at things like one comma one where we have two in the, four and two in the four bar, or we could look at like two comma zero where all of them are in the four, but we just double the number. And um, the, yeah, so maybe just as, as a fun fact, the, um, the largest superconformal algebra Um, with um, with a physical 
stress tensor multiplet. is 60 2 comma 0. So um, if, if I have time in the next lecture, I might talk about superconformal algebras in different space-time dimensions. But just, just to say quickly, they only exist up to six dimensions, superconformal algebras. You can't have anything that's a superconformal algebra in seven dimensions, for instance. And the, the ones that are superconformal have to be chiral. You can't have like a 1, 1 superconformal field theory. It has to be chiral. So you could have 1, 0, or 2, 0. Uh -huh. I was just maybe going to make a comment to, to also edify some of this. So in, in any even dimension, you can always have chiral spinners, left-handed spinners and right-handed spinners. In dimensions divisible by 4, left-handed spinners and right-handed spinners are equivalent to each other. You can always turn right-handed spinners into left-handed spinners with conjugation. So we don't have to distinguish them. It's only in even dimensions not divisible by four that we have to distinguish between left-handed and right-handed spinners. And that's why we do this first comma second thing in two and six dimensions. And then in 10 dimensions, we could call them two comma zero and one comma one, but we call them two B and two A. Yes. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh -huh. Can you explicitly break one of the superchargers and then get a CD theory with just one supercharger? Or is that just not possible? Uh, you mean here when I say there, there are two of them? Yeah. Um, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be a supersymmetric theory at that point. What does, yeah. that, what does it mean that it's not even like if I have a supercharger, how does that? Can I just have one like can I have mega theory where just one survives? Yeah. So, so the question was in in a case like this where there are two supercharges, can I somehow? break one of them and still have a theory that's like half supersymmetry or something. Um, yeah, offhand I, offhand, I don't know if there's a way to. There are like half supersymmetry cases. Oh, Ferrara. OK, OK. Yeah, so maybe Ferrara has. So, so Greg's comment was Ferrara with half supersymmetry. And what makes sorry, what, what, what's the what makes it have half supersymmetry rather than full supersymmetry with just one supercharge? Like what makes a theory super like what makes us call the theory supersymmetric? Like, yeah, so so basically I want to be able to write down something which which is like the supersymmetry algebra which, so um, so I want to write down something like Q alpha. So this this alpha now runs from one to four. It's like a sixty spinner index. So we, we want something where, where this is going to be 2 p alpha beta. Um, so this, this is our um, momentum. And I, I said we need to anti-symmetrize these indices. And so then we also would need to anti-symmetrize the, the i and j indices. And so, so this. So, so this is why you need um, so you need to anti-symmetrize it to be able to write down the algebra. So if we if we just so this i and j runs over this has a su two r fundamental. And so this epsilon is is uh, in very is, is a way to make it work. Right, so if, you, if we got rid of one of them, then I, I wouldn't know how to write this down. But I guess check on the archive, or maybe it's pre-archive for Ferrara. Yeah. OK, um, let's see. So where, how should I wrap this up? Yeah, so maybe, So let, let's let's briefly go back to this 2D uh, 2 2 case in the remaining time. I'm sorry, I started like that, but there's just one in it at this point. Ah, okay, okay. Um, 
<laughs> yeah. So, yeah, maybe if there's one minute, I should just ask if there are questions. Uh, good. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, in fact, that's that's something fun about this um, about these potentials, which is that. So, this is what you would call the um, a n. Maybe a one is is x squared. Yeah. So, these this is what we would call the a n potentials. And there's a ADE classification, which is actually related to Arnold's classification of singularities, where we can write down ADE versions of these superpotentials. So right, so so we could write down. Um, I was in fact thinking of writing them down. So with for the D and E series, we need to introduce another chiral superfield called Y, and so we can write down superpotentials involving X and Y that have an ADE classification, and this flow to the um, C less than one minimal models. Yeah, that's a nice comment. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Loop corrections? Yes. Yes. So, so basically, what happens is that um, so so the question was about anomalous dimensions for these operators. So so they definitely get anomalous dimensions. Like like here, we know we know in this case that um, you know this this phi starts off with some dimension, which is its free field dimension, and then by the time it gets to the fixed point, it has some other operator dimensions. And the nice thing in the supersymmetric case, which, which is what I was about to discuss more, is that we can read off the dimensions from, from the R charges, just, just like we did in this case. So in this case, we said that um, in, um, where was it? In 3D. Yeah, so like in, in 3D, um, this, this was, uh, let's call this delta of x. So the exact operator dimension at the fixed point of this operator x is 2 thirds. And in the free field case, it was 1 half. So there was an RG flow where it started off its life as having R charge 1 half in the UV limit, where it was a free field. And then its, um, its operator dimension went from a half up to 2 thirds. And so this is like some anomalous dimension. We would say the difference between this 1 half and 2 thirds is some anomalous dimension for that operator x. And so usually we would have to compute these anomalous dimensions. You know, in perturbation theory, we could work hard to compute these anomalous dimensions. But here, the supersymmetry algebra just tells us the exact answer. So yeah, so the anomalous dimension of this operator would be 2 thirds minus a half. Thanks. Okay. Any other? Okay, okay, thanks. I haven't heard that we don't have coffee, so hopefully we have coffee.